Sir Otto Hightower served as Hand of the King to three different kings of Westeros, Jaehaerys I, Viserys I, and Aegon II. This is a feat very rarely shared by individuals in Westerosi history. I think there's only one who was that prolific in terms of kings served under, that being Viserys II, one of my favorite characters in the entire history of Westeros. However, Otto Hightower is commonly derided as terrible. He's often compared to Tywin, Lannister, and Littlefinger, both of whom were pretty effective administrators. However, Otto is pretty much just very commonly hated for a number of reasons. He was recently, in Season 2, Episode 2 of House of the Dragon, dismissed from his position as Hand of the King by Aegon II. Today, we're going to examine that decision, as well as Otto's reign, or assistance to reign, over the past three monarchs, and see if there were any ways in which it could have possibly been worse, and analyzing his overall quality as a Hand of the King. I'm Quinn the GM, and let's dive into it. Otto first served as Hand of the King to Jaehaerys I Targaryen. The old king reigned for 60 years, and Otto ruled as his hand for the last, I believe, 8 to 10 of those. He was pretty much coasting on the peace and roads he'd built early on in his reign by that point, and Otto as a hand really didn't have much to do other than ensure that existing systems of governance were functioning as they wanted. We don't really get any hints as to his schemes in this era. We don't see them on screen, and they're not uh, very remarkable in Fire and Blood either, but there is one rather interesting accusation that gets made by Viserys in episode 4 of the first season of House of the Dragon. Otto is fired by Viserys in this episode for uh, insinuating that Daemon and Winero were coupling in uh, a brothel in King's Landing, dear me. Um, he is essentially being scolded by Viserys as he's being fired, as was kind of a quid pro quo with Rhaenyra ma marrying Laenor. Uh, but in this conversation, Viserys kind of insinuates that Otto might have killed his father, Balon. Balon was the Hand of the King before Otto Hightower to Jaehaerys I. He died of quote-unquote a burst belly very suddenly. He was pretty young, he was pretty healthy, and it's fairly mysterious. However, it's unclear as to whether this was actually poisoning. It doesn't seem particularly likely to me. Uh, a burst belly is Westerosi code for appendicitis, since they are not medically advanced enough to recognize what that is or give it a pretty specific name. Uh, in my very uh, detailed research as a medical expert, I've found that uh, both lead and mercury can theoretically be used to induce appendicitis, but that actually coming into effect is something that A, would probably take a long time, and B, might fall beyond the scope of uh, auto as not uh, being very proficient in poisons, from what we know. Before we move on to Viserys, I'd love to hear what, who you think is the best and worst Hand of the King in Westerosi history. Viserys is going to be broken into two sections here, so Otto has pretty distinct parts of his reign. His first reign under Viserys as Hand of the King, taking up the early part of the Peaceful King's reign, is actually pretty good in my eyes. I think it's setting up the seeds for things to be not good. I think there's one very not good action he takes, but overall, the main kind of administrative action that Otto takes is convincing uh, Viserys to name Rhaenyra as his only heir. Otto obviously hates Daemon and wants to increase the power of his own faction, which very much makes sense. He's a pretty savvy political player, but naming uh, Rhaenyra as Viserys' heir is not necessarily a bad thing inherently. I do think that based on all we see of her and of Daemon, she probably has a much better temperament for the crown than Daemon does. I think that giving the crown to her inherently is not a good, not a bad thing, excuse me. I think that as we see in the show, she very much could handle it well, though Otto, of course, is making this move for a fairly pragmatic political reason. That political reason being that he wanted to marry his daughter Alicent to Viserys as quickly as possible. Alicent could then bear him a son, and that son could be a much better candidate for rule than Rhaenyra because he's a boy, and that's how succession works, of course. Otto really was just driving towards this throughout the earlier half of Viserys' reign. We see this primarily in Season 1, Episode 3, where he's continually kind of pestering to marry Rhaenyra and Aegon, which I think just would have gone great. Uh, so Otto just really wanted his blood on the throne for some reason or another. He really doesn't seem to care what he has to do to do it. And that very much seems to kind of muddy the waters in terms of his actual ability to uh, administer justice or any sort of governance as Hand of the King. It is this insistence on Aegon and this trying to tear Rhaenyra and Daemon down despite him telling the truth in episode four, that eventually gets him fired from his position as hand for about a decade. The entire time skip in the middle of the season, Otto is not serving his hand. 
Once Otto returns to the fold after the time skip and after the double patricide fratricide by Laris Strong, he sets to work very much ruling the realm in the stead of his king, who is ailing. In the books, Viserys is still around and not really sick, but Otto is still very much kind of holding the keys to the kingdom as he is much more assertive than the king he rules for. And it is in this time he tries to kind of solidify the high tower position and ensure that a big rift forms between different parts of the family. He internalizes this kind of hatred of each other, especially in Allison, who in turn internalizes it to uh, her children, Aemond and uh, Aegon especially, and this creates a cycle of violence that en eventually eventuates in Lucerus's death above the storm's end that kicks off the Dance of the Dragons. I will say Otto's actions towards the beginning of the war are fairly pragmatic. If you are looking at things from his perspective and trying to advance the green cause, which is fairly unjust inherently, but I digress, uh, the idea of dealing with Rhaenyra immediately and just hopefully getting her faction out of line, out of whack immediately, and just taking out the head is pretty objectively the right way to go about it, avoiding all of the war. It's like Ty what Tywin says, why is it more honorable to kill a thousand men in battle than ten at dinner? Uh, just kind of that deal, not that I agree with Tywin on anything, but if we were just looking for a pragmatic governance sense, Otto is probably correct there. However, he does not get his way. Uh, Alicent finds Aegon first, and thus gets to have some peace treaties brought by Otto to Rhaenyra, which, if she actually wanted those peace treaties to succeed, she probably shouldn't have sent the person who didn't want them to succeed as her messenger. We then arrive at King Aegon II. We see in the first and second episodes that Otto is mainly a voice of reason and voice of caution on Aegon's council, and this is much to his detriment. It very much is the right way to do a war. He's trying to win them allies and ensure that they have the strength behind them before actually striking, but that is not something that's going to play well with his two grandsons, both of whom have more actual feasible power than Otto does. Uh, both of them have dragons, and in Aegon's case, he is the king, and as we see in episode two, he has the power to unhand Otto. Otto is very much someone who wants to do things by the book, at least so long as the book benefits him, and we see that in his supposed actions to Aegon, trying to send out ravens, get support for Aegon's cause however he can, rather than just going immediately to war and having the dragons burn everyone as Aegon does. We also see the seeds of kind of a rift planted by Laris. We see that eventuate pretty quickly in episode two. Uh, but overall, I think that Otto's main downfall was probably how he acted with Aegon in the throne room in the first episode. I think that A, that was a great scene, and B, Otto just really made it kind of seem like he was humiliating Aegon there. And I think that Aegon is someone who would take a slight like that very personally and would not forget it. We'll see where Otto goes from here. I'm not going to give any spoilers as to the books uh, for this part forward, but I do think it is interesting to see him without his position of power and still remaining at court. I did note in the first episode, he seems to be drinking in pretty much every scene, so that could signal that maybe he's starting to develop a habit or starting to lose control of himself to some extent. I digress. Regardless, it's going to be very interesting to see how exactly Otto's plot kind of continues in season two of House of the Dragon. And I'm very excited to see how the Greens develop throughout the entirety of this show. The Greens are really fun. They're kind of a train wreck to watch, but a very entertaining train wreck at that. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a like and subscribe. I'd really appreciate it. It helps me grow the channel. There'll be much more Song of Ice and Fire and House of the Dragon content in the near future. Uh, also, leave a comment while you're down there. Let me know what you think of this video and what you want to see from me in the future. I will have another video coming out later this week. I would bet on Thursday, starting a brand new series where I am recapping what happened to a Song of Ice and Fire characters in the last most couple recent books, as I think the Winds of Winter might be on the horizon and a recap might be in order. Additionally, I'll be going through what I think will happen to them in the Winds of Winter. So it should be a fun series. It'll start on Thursday with a video on Cersei Lannister. Thank you for watching. Goodbye, everyone.